Good morning, distinguished guests, Chairman Powell and members of the Federal Reserve Board, including our very own Lisa Cook, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, Raphael Bostic and its members, Spellman Board of Trustee members, administrators, faculty, friends of the college, individuals from institutions throughout Georgia, and the remarkable community of Spellman, welcome. I am Marinette Holmes, Chair of the Department of Economics here at Spelman, and it is a privilege for my department to co-host this momentous occasion. Today marks a historic event in Spelman's 142-year history, the first visit by a Federal Reserve Board Chairman. This is a... Yes. Yes. This is a tremendous honor, honor for our institution. Founded in 1881, Spelman has been training women to take leadership roles in all sectors of society. Our very founding was an investment in the potential of black women and girls to use their education for the good of society. Today, we are very proud of the return on investment Thousands of graduates represent the institution across this country in all areas, and given the occasion, we are especially proud of the impact Spelman women are having within the economic and financial sectors. Today's fireside chat between Federal Reserve Board Chairman Powell and Spelman's President, Dr. Gale, promises to be an insightful discussion on crucial topics such as the post-COVID economy. Under Chairman Powell's leadership, the Federal Reserve has placed a high value on diversity, recruiting a record number of women and persons of color, holding seats on the boards of the Federal Reserve Banks, including the bank here in Atlanta. We are delighted to acknowledge the most diverse Board of Governors in the agency's 109-year history, including Spelman alumna, Governor Lisa D. Cook. Yes. Yes, yes. And let's celebrate her for her achievements and thanks to her. Thank her because the Economics Department currently houses the Lisa D. Cook Scholars, a scholar program designed to address the scarcity of black women pursuing graduate degrees in economics. And I am now pleased to introduce one of those scholars. Lisa Williams, class of 2025 from Novi, Michigan, a junior economics major with a minor in management organization who will introduce today's speaker. And once again, welcome to this historic event at Spelman College. Good morning, everybody. Jerome H. Powell first took office as the chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System on February 5, 2018. He was then reappointed to office and sworn in for a second term on May 23, 2022. Chair Powell also serves as chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee, the system's principal monetary policymaking body. Chair Powell has served as a member of the Board of Governors since taking office in May 2012. He was later reappointed and sworn in during June 2014 for a term ending January 31st, 2028. Prior to his appointment to the board, Chair Powell was a visiting scholar at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., where he focused on federal and state fiscal issues. From 1997 to 2005, Chair Powell was a partner at the Carlisle Group. He served as an assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury under President George H.W. Bush with responsibility for policy on financial institutions, the Treasury debt market, and other related areas. Prior to joining the Bush administration, Chairman Powell worked as a lawyer and an investment banker in New York City. In addition to service on corporate boards, he has served on the boards of charitable and educational institutions, including the Benheim Center for Finance at Princeton University and the Nature Conservancy of Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Chairman Powell was born in February 1953 in Washington, D.C. He received a bachelor's in politics from Princeton University in 1975 and earned a law degree from Georgetown University in 1979. 
Helene D. Gale began serving as the 11th president of Spelman College on July 1, 2022. President Gale previously served as both president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust from October 2017 to June 2022. Under her leadership, the trust adopted a new strategic focus on closing the racial wealth gap in the Chicago region. For almost a decade, President Gale served as both president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization. As a pediatrician and public health physician with expertise in economic development, humanitarian efforts, and health issues, she spent 20 years with the CDC working primarily on HIV and AIDS. A member, a previous member of the Federal Reserve of Chicago's board, President Gill currently serves on both public company and nonprofit boards, including the Coca-Cola Company, Organon, Palo Alto Networks, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Brookings Institution, New America, and the One Campaign. She is also an inaugural member of President Biden's Advisory Council on African Diaspora Engagement in the United States of America. President Gale is from Buffalo, New York. She earned a bachelor's in psychology at Barnard College, a doctor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University. She is a full professor at Spelman College, a recipient of 18 honorary degrees, and also holds faculty appointments at the University of Washington and Emory University. Please join me in warmly welcoming Federal Reserve Board Chairman Jerome Powell to the stage as he offers his remarks, and afterward, we look forward to President Gill joining Chairman Powell for an engaging discussion on navigating pathways to economic mobility. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Holmes and, and President Gale for inviting me here. Um, uh, it's very exciting to be here. Um, and I'm fortunate to have been accompanied from Washington by a very distinguished graduate of Spelman College, class of 1986, and a member of Delta Sigma Theta. <laughs> my, my Federal Reserve colleague, Governor Lisa Cook. Um, I'd say there's no greater testament to Spellman's historic legacy than the achievements of outstanding women like Governor Cook. One part of that legacy is Spellman's tradition of promoting education in STEM. Governor Cook's research highlights the key role of such education in preparing individuals to be inventors and innovators who can generate ideas that will add to our body of knowledge, increase productivity, and generate higher living standards over time. Her work is just one example of how Spellman women continue to make historic contributions in science, the arts, technology, medicine, and other fields. I look forward to our uh, conversation, and I thought I might frame it up uh, first by talking about the Federal Reserve's ongoing actions to promote a healthy economy and how those actions relate to questions that students in this audience uh, might be asking about the future. For example, I'm, I imagine students are wondering what kind of job market and what kind of economy you'll be entering when you complete your education. To start, um, Congress assigned the Fed the dual mandate goals of maximum employment and price stability, and both of these goals are essential aspects of a healthy economy. Congress also gave the Fed a precious grants, grant of independence from direct political control to allow us to pursue those goals without consideration of political matters. Other major central banks in democratic societies around the world have similar grants of independence, and this institutional arrangement has a strong track record of producing better policy outcomes for the benefit of the public. So let me go to the two dual mandate goals, and I'll start with maximum employment. Uh, I'm glad to say that by many measures, the conditions in the labor market today are very strong. A couple of years ago, if you go back, the pandemic uh, was receding and the economy was reopening the number of job openings grew to greatly exceed the supply of people who were available to work, leaving there a widespread shortage of workers. Today, labor conditions remain very strong, um, and the economy is returning to better balance between demand and supply for workers. The pace at which the economy is uh, creating new jobs remains strong uh, and has been slowing toward a more sustainable level. That gradual slowing has come in part due to the, uh, the efforts of the Fed to slow the growth of the economy to help reduce high inflation. 
After declining sharply uh, during the pandemic, the supply of workers has bounced back as people have come back into the labor force and as immigration has returned to pre-pandemic levels. Partly because of that labor force growth, the unemployment rate has edged up over the second half of the year, although it remains historically low at 3.9 percent. The increase in labor force participation has been particularly strong among women in the prime working years of ages 25 to 54, which surged to an all-time high earlier this year and which remains high and above pre-pandemic levels. Wage growth uh, remains high, but has been gradually moving toward levels that would be more consistent with 2 percent inflation over time. So real, which is to say uh, inflation-adjusted wages, wages after inflation are also growing again as inflation declines. Turning uh, to, to price stability, then, uh, the second part of the mandate, we have a longer-run goal of 2 percent inflation, and after running below 2 percent for over a decade, inflation increased sharply in 2021 in the United States and in many other countries around the world. High inflation imposes a significant hardship on all households and is especially painful for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. Beginning in early 2022, uh, we reacted forcefully, raising our policy interest rate and de decreasing the size of our balance sheet to help slow the economy and bring down inflation. And inflation has now declined to 3 percent over the 12 months ending in October. But if you factor out energy and food prices, uh, which tend to be volatile, you get what's called core inflation, and we look at that too. That is still on a 12-month basis, 3.5 percent, well above our 2 percent objective. However, over the six months now, looking at more recent data, the six months ending in October, core inflation is actually running at about 2.5 percent. And while the, these lower inflation readings of the past few months are welcome, they're highly welcome, that progress is going to need to continue if we are to reach our 2 percent objective. The high inflation that we got uh, beginning in, in 21 initially emerged from a collision between very strong demand and pandemic-constrained supply. And the normalization of supply and demand conditions that we've seen has played a critical role in the disinflation, the coming down of inflation so far, as has the, the substantial tightening of monetary policy and overall financial conditions over the past two years. The strong actions that we've taken have moved our policy rate up and well into restrictive territory, by which we mean that tight monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. Monetary policy is thought to affect economic conditions with a lag, and the full effects of our tightening likely have not yet been felt. The forcefulness of our response to inflation also helped maintain the Fed's hard-won credibility, ensuring that the public's expectations of future inflation remain well anchored. Having come so far and so quickly, the FOMC is moving carefully forward as the risks of under- and over-tightening are becoming more balanced. As the demand and supply-related effects of the pandemic continue to unwind, uncertainty about the outlook for the economy is unusually elevated. Like most forecasters, my colleagues and I anticipate that growth in spending and output will slow over the next year as the effects of the pandemic and the reopening fade and as re restrictive monetary policy weighs on aggregate demand. The FOMC is strongly committed to bringing inflation down to 2 percent over time and to keeping policy restrictive until we are confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. It would be, it would be premature to conclude with confidence that we have achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance or to speculate on po when policy might ease. We are prepared to tighten policy further if it becomes appropriate to do so. So we're making decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. And that's an overview of what my colleagues and I at the Fed are working to accomplish. The bottom line, if you're a student, is that we've made considerable, pro considerable progress in reducing high inflation while remaining – while maintaining a strong labor market with a lot of opportunity for new graduates. The unemployment rate has moved up a bit, but it's still very low by historical standards and by measure – by many measures, it's a great time to start your career. You'll face challenging decisions soon about what professions to enter and what companies and other institutions to work for. 
of course, some of you will become entrepreneurs. But each of you has already made one really good decision, and that's coming here to Spelman. Whatever opportunities and challenges emerge, education will continue to be a key to success. Higher education is an investment and not just of money. You're investing your time and great effort to gain knowledge and skills that are preparing you for successful careers. Your success will make for a stronger economy. For our part at the Fed, we're doing our best to foster an economy that gives you the best opportunity to succeed. And with that, I will hand it back to you, President Gale. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and particularly thank you for that word of encouragement to our students. Sometimes um, in the midst of what has been a turbulent economy, it may seem a little uh, daunting, but uh, as we spell, say at Spelman, we are undaunted. So, um, And I also want to thank Lisa Cook um, for all that you did to make this visit happen, but also for all that you do to represent this school so well. So thank you so much. And to uh, your colleague and our friend, <laughs> Raphael Bostic, who is the president of the Atlanta Fed, it is an honor to have you here with us. And our colleague from Georgia Tech, Kay uh, Husbands Feeling, thank you so much. She's been our co-collaborator in building this. So let me just start. Um, and before I dive in, maybe just start with a few comments about you, or a few questions about you. Um, how did you get here? <laughs> okay, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I know how you really got here. <laughs> but, but you're not an economist. You are trained as a lawyer, did investment banking, um, did some other stints in the public sector. <clears throat> What was your kind of your journey, and would the young person, like the young people who are sitting out here today, be surprised at where your path took you? So my path was, I'll start with uh, when I graduated from college. And I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, and the whole Washington, D.C. political scene is there, but my parents and my family were not, were not part of that. We were just people who lived in Washington. My dad was a lawyer. But when I graduated from college, I really had... I didn't have a plan. I hadn't thought it through, but I, I did have one thought, and that was that I wanted to be somebody who had a, a, a private sector career, but who also came in and served, did public service from time to time. And I was thinking of people like Cyrus Vance or George Schultz, who had you know important private sector careers, but every eight, ten, twelve years they would come in and serve in, in, in the government for a while. That's a that's a unique feature of the U.S. system. You don't really see that in, in that people can have both of those. And oddly enough, that's kind of what happened. So I wound up going to law school. I couldn't, it wasn't that I was dying to be a lawyer, but that was a, an obvious thing. My dad was a lawyer. I practiced law for just a few years, and then I moved into investment banking because I, I, we were working with serving investment bankers, and I could see they were having more fun than we were. <laughs> So I moved into investment banking, and I, I really enjoyed that. It was uh, I, I, I worked on a lot of mergers. It's a very exciting thing to do. Did that for quite a while. Um, after doing that for a while, I had an opportunity to do public service, and I did move to Washington and, and serve in the Treasury Department as, a tre as an assistant and undersecretary under President Bush Sr. Then I moved, you know, so I did that. Uh, then I went back into the financial business and, and uh, was a partner in a big private equity firm for a while. And now here I am back in public service. So I, what would you take out of that? One, um, it's, it, is, it is a real, um, it's a, such an honor to do public service. And if you have a mainly private sector career um, and you want to give back through public service, you can do it in this country. And I think, it, it, I, think I would think this, but I, I think it, it, it's important that people in government positions, at least some of them, have had the experience of being in the private sector. At the same time, I, I think um, being in the private sector, I think, is informed by also having worked in the public sector. So those are some things. So that, that's how it all happened. Um, and, uh, yeah, nobody it – was, it was pretty unpredictable, but I was willing to change careers and, and pay the price money. and pay the price of having to, to learn a new field. I had to do that over and over again, but it was worth it. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> curiosity is probably another one of the things that spurred you on, uh, which is one of the things we talk to students about all the time. Now, um, 
as a leader, you get a <clears throat> lot of high marks. This year's uh, word of the year in Merriam-Webster was authentic. And people often talk about you as being an authentic leader. Could you talk a bit about how you see your <clears throat> leadership, your leadership style, and authenticity is a tough thing to to uh, pull off when every word that you say <laughs> uh, people hang on to. So how do you play the role of an authentic leader with such a very, very difficult, challenging job? Um, so the, the Fed, you know, I step into a role. The Fed does so many things well and right, and the people I succeed have, are such heroes, really, and, and so successful and so good at what they did. So, but I, what I, 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 I think when I think of myself in that way, I, I, I'm kind of a more informal, I'm a relatively informal person, and I think of, uh, I really do think of um, getting to good decisions. Part of it is just having a lot of really smart people around you, like, like President Bostic, like Governor Cook, hearing what they think. And, and, you know, hearing a bunch of different views and a little bit crowdsourcing, thinking about issues and then coming to a decision after that. That, that real, that's a very comfortable decision. So, but that requires you to, to really hear what people are saying and understand their arguments. So that, that comes, that comes naturally to me. I also, um, I felt that it was important that we, that we substantially increase our, our outreach to Congress, which has oversight. In our system of government, it's Congress that has oversight over the Fed, and so we, we, my colleagues and I, spend much more time than we used to going up to the, the Hill and talking to them and listening to them more, and I think that really that really pays off. They understand that we're a non-political agency, doesn't use talking points, we're just trying to do our jobs and stick to our jobs, and I think even if they don't agree with what, what you're doing, and even if it's very difficult times, they know that you're doing your very best and they trust you to do that. So um, on that, uh, one of the things I think you have done well, and I would argue your predecessor was good at this as well, is trying to decode the Fed a bit. You know, it is, for many, still a mystery, and you, you started talking about the dual mandate and what really is the Fed's responsibility. Um, but you don't have a lot of tools. You have a limited set of tools, if you will, to, to have an impact on that. But people think that the Fed can do all things for the economy. Could you talk a bit about where your uh, responsibilities and what you are able to do end and where others need to take the next step and, and move things forward, and particularly this interface between monetary policy and fiscal policy and how that works um, in the real world? Let me, I will, let me start by, by saying the things that we actually do do. So the, the thing that, that I talked about was monetary policy. So we use our tools to foster maximum employment and price stability. Two equal goals in the law. And, and that involves raising interest rates and using our balance sheet to either slow gradually or, or speed up the economy to, to, to move the economy toward those goals. We also, though, regulate and supervise banks. We have a broad responsibility to support financial stability to the entire financial system, which we do really through our liquidity tools. That was the original purpose of central banks was to be there with, with, uh, with liquid, with liquidity, with, with cash when banks, when, when bank runs emerge. And if there is, if there's a facility there that, that exists, then the bank run doesn't happen in the first place because people know they'll get their money. We also play a, an important role in the payment system. So we have pretty broad roles. Um, you know, people do expect things of us that we don't really do, and it's, it is really important to respect the line. Most things in our system of government are and should be assigned to the elected branch. Nobody, nobody elected us to, to do things. They, we're appointed to do specific, narrow, really important things and stick to those things. It's the elected branch of people. They've stood for election. The president has, the Senate has, the Congress has, and it's, it's very important to to not walk onto their turf because those things are, you know, are consigned to the democratically elected branches. Very few things are assigned to an institution like the Fed that has the, the protections I, I mentioned. We serve long terms. We can't be fired except for malfeasance. And, you know, Congress would have to pass a law to reverse one of our decisions. No one, no one can do it. So we have to respect that, um, 
that independence by sticking to the jobs that we have, even though, you know, it's very frequent. When I testify, which I do a lot, we had a senator speak to us at dinner the other night, and he pointed out that whenever they have, you know, me or the, a Fed chair in the chair testifying, they always try to get us to support their fiscal policy. Nice. You know, raising taxes, cutting spending, all those things. And we just, we just can't do that. We have to stick to what we do and stay out of politics, and that's what keeps the Fed independence. And it, it's what enables us to be that rare thing in Washington, which is a non-political agency that is respected by both sides, where, where they'll give us the room, they'll criticize us publicly, but they'll give us the room to do our jobs, and our jobs are really critical for every American. Yeah. Um, and that is that nonpartisan and people believing in that is so, so, so important. Um, <clears throat> You know, there are things that you can do specifically as the Fed, and you talked about them, things that you can't do. But one of the other things that you have as the chairman of the Federal Reserve is the bully pulpit. <clears throat> Could you talk about how you have used that and where you think the limits of that, where is that useful, and what are some of the kinds of things that you use your bully pulpit for? It's um, That's a very challenging uh, subject because, of course, you know, uh, I have many opinions that, that stray far beyond our, uh, and all of us do, far beyond our narrow mandate. So the, the occasions for addressing topics that are not precisely our mandate have to be very few and, and very selective. So Fed chairs have traditionally been willing to say about fiscal policy, for example, that the U.S. budget, federal budget, is on an unsustainable path, meaning that the debt is growing <laughs> substantially faster than the economy, which in the long run is by definition unsustainable in the long run. But, but we, don't, we don't get into calling Congress out or, you know, telling them how to balance the, you know, how, how to bring down the deficit and that. We don't do that. We, we, and I, I stay out of that because, you know, we're not, we're not fully achieving one of our major goals right now, which is the inflation goal. So, and Congress has oversight over us, not vice versa. But there, there are occasions when you have to say something. So, and, and, you know, we did. We were one of many, many, many public and private organizations that had to, had to speak up about the George Floyd incident in, in, in that very extraordinary moment in our history. And, um, and we did. And I, I wouldn't take that back. But, but we, don't, we don't want to be commenting on, on political issues except in the rarest of circumstances like that one. Mm -hmm. um. We talked a little bit about this intersection between fiscal and monetary policy. I think COVID is a good mm -hmm. example of how both the Fed as well as the administration and Congress really put extraordinary measures in place to be able to, as best as possible, control what was a very challenging economic uh, situation. What have you learned <clears throat> from that? What were some of the best practices? What are some of the lessons learned um, from what was an extraordinary time? Um, I'm tempt it's tempted to start by saying that, you know, we'll need some more years of perspective to really look back and, and have a better answer. But I'll give you a sort of a in the middle of things um, tentative answer. So, I mean, I'd start with the fact that the U.S. economy has, a, has really been the star performer in the world since COVID. And so, you know, we've had a higher growth. We've had a stronger labor market. We actually have had inflation coming down now uh, as fast or faster than, than most other economies. Um, so basically, compared to other countries, we've done well. Um, looking back, uh, the economy got stronger much faster, I think, than we expected and than most people expected. If you think about, you know, if you go back to the, the time of COVID when it was actually hitting, in, in the first half of 2020, you're looking at a situation where the economy around the world is closing, where we don't have any idea how long it'll take to get vaccines, <clears throat> where we don't know how we will reopen the economy. If you can't get vaccines, we didn't know how lethal the disease was gonna be. So there were real possibilities that, that you could be in a longer term situation where you just couldn't get the economy back up to full speed. We just didn't know. And so Congress acted, I mean, with no dissents, Imagine that. No dissents passed the CARES Act, which, which literally put trillions of dollars of potential lending power in our hands. It was so big that we didn't have to use it. 
the, the, you know, the financial markets were kind of closed and they reopened without our having to use this, this authority. So we've made very few loans in the end. It was, it was amazing. But, so if you look back on that, I mean, you, you, what you know now that you didn't know then was that the economy really did recover much more quickly and much more forcefully than we thought. And of course, you would have acted a little bit differently, uh, knowing that. Um, but overall, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to judge this with some, with some, uh, over time, looking back over time. Remember how extraordinarily unusual, unique the, the circumstances were. We hadn't had a pandemic in a hundred years. No one knew what to do. At the very beginning, there was a question, well, what is the, why is the Fed even focusing on this? And then, you know, if you remember, there was a very small stimulus bill that couldn't pass before, the, and then two weeks later, the CARES Act is passing with all this. So it was, a, it was a moment of great uncertainty and learning. And so we're still <clears throat> probably in a moment of a fair amount of uncertainty, partly because <clears throat> the economy isn't acting as might have been expected. So sitting now, thinking forward, um, to the extent that uh, anyone can prognosticate, what are some of the lessons, because of what we went through with COVID, that might help us think about where we need to go, even though things are uh, a bit unpredictable still? The economy has repeatedly surprised us and, and all other forecasters. It's, um, so if you go back a year, not many people, and I'm not, I'm not aware of any people who forecasted that we would have quite the level of strong growth that we have had in 2023, around 2.5%, two a labor market that's still been creating millions of jobs, and yet inflation beginning in June coming down, you know, very meaningfully, so coming down significantly. So, and those are all good things. All three of those things are good things. So we've been surprised on, on the upside this year. In 2022, when we were raising rates very rapidly, it didn't seem what, like we were getting any, any payback from that, but we really did get a lot of payback this year, and we also got the unwinding of those pandemic effects that I talked about. So that's the, you know, people dropped out of the labor force, and they didn't come back in 22, and then they did come back in 23, and also immigration picked mm -hmm. up. So all well, that's happening. So looking ahead, um, <clears throat> once again, we're still in a place where there is no, you know, there isn't any experience with, year three of the pandemic recovery, the last time we had a pandemic. It's just, it's just unique. But so if you, if you just take on board what I said about where the economy is and where policy is, policy is at a restrictive level, meaning it's holding the economy back. Inflation is still running well above target, but it's moving in the right direction. So we think the right thing to be doing now is to be moving carefully, thinking carefully about, uh, about how things are going on, letting, letting the data tell us what the story is. The data will tell us whether we've done enough, whether we need to do more, and uh, that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, um, uh, we're, we're moving, I would characterize it as moving carefully. Yeah, and kind of taking it based on circumstances by circumstance. <laughs> Let the yeah. data, sh you know, right. reveal the, the appropriate path. We don't need to be in a rush now. Having moved, you know, quickly and forcefully, we're getting what we wanted to get, we, we now don't have to, we now have the, the, the ability to, to move carefully. So <clears throat> probably my last COVID-related um, question, but clearly one of the hallmarks of the COVID um, economy was how globally interdependent we are. <clears throat> um, could you talk a bit about your relationship to the other central banks and how during times like that, you work together, what are the ways in which you balance each other, and just a sense of how we, as the United States Central Bank, collaborate with others. Yes, um, so the central banks meet six times a year in um, Basel, Switzerland, just the central banks, not the elected governments, not the finance ministries. And I, I didn't, that wasn't part of my world before I was chair, but so we, um, and we don't issue communiques, we just talk about, we, we go there for three days and we just talk about what's going on in economies around the world. And also they're just, they're, they're cross-cutting issues that, <clears throat> that we deal with, like how's inflation going and, and all, all the things that, that, that matter for the economy, what's happening in labor markets, what's happening with monetary policy. So that, that's enormously informative. And as, as you pointed out, nothing, nothing proves the, how global the economy is better than, than the pandemic, Crisis. right? I mean, yeah. it was global. 
during the pandemic, I was in extremely regular, often more than once a day, with other heads of other major central banks by phone. Um, we, we were the only one. Remember, at the time of the global financial crisis 15 years ago, there was plenty of room to cut interest rates. That was not the case. We, our interest rate was really the only one that was far enough above zero that we could meaningfully cut it, which we did. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we were always talking, the major central banks were always talking about what's going on, learning from each other and that kind of thing. And it's, it's very important because when, when there's an international crisis, you need to know the people you're working with and you need to trust them. You, and, and by the way, this is very much replicated at the staff levels between the major central banks <clears throat> because a lot of the, you know, when there is a crisis, a lot of the knowledge about what to do and how, how to do it in our very complex financial system in the plumbing of it, that rests with, with the staff as well as with governors and, and reserve bank presidents. But the staffs know each other well. There's a seamless web around the world of people with, that, with all that knowledge, which in a crisis, to see them come come to work and, and do what they do is, is truly amazing. Do you feel like, having gone through that crisis <clears throat> together, the system of central banks is working even closer together than before? I think we, um, we, we, don't, we don't have the ability to, you know, we don't do, yeah, sure. we don't collaborate on, we each serve a domestic mandate, right? right. Our mandate is to, is to work for the people of the United States. But yes, I think we, um, there's a, there's a world where we where we really understand each other and know what we're doing. The, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and there are dollar, dollar funding markets around the world that are very important for our economy. So we support the the dollar as a reserve currency by by uh, we have five standing swap lines, and we we actually opened up nine additional ones with central banks around the world to support the role of the dollar. It's in, uh, dollar. It's enormously important in relieving financial stress. And in, both in the global financial crisis and during the pandemic, so we're, we're very mindful of international uh, international economic flows, and it, it's a critical part and much of, a much bigger part of the chair's job than I than I would have thought uh, watching you know from from the, the seat of a governor. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let me talk about an issue that is near and dear to my heart, um, <clears throat> and I think is also a big concern for many people here in Atlanta, and that's wealth inequality, um, and particularly the racial <coughs> wealth gap, which um, in Atlanta is, I think we're ranked number four, the two, three, or four, I don't know, Raphael, where are we ranked number, we're, we're up there, um, in terms of <coughs> wealth, uh, wealth inequality here in the Atlanta region. Um, obviously, there are um, some things that the Fed can do to impact that, that but also not, a, a, there are also things the Fed cannot do. I know it's something you have talked <clears throat> a lot about. Your predecessor, Janet Yellen, also talked about that. Could you speak to wealth inequality, thoughts that you have about the ways that the Fed can and cannot be helpful? And I say that also thinking about some of the critique that people have around uh, bank regulations and how that may or may not play into the ability for low-income populations to get access to credit and, and, um, and important things like mortgages and credit for, for starting businesses. So bottom line, wealth inequality, what can the Fed do, what can the Fed not do, and are there more things that you'd like to see happen to um, make that less of an issue here in this country? So we... Um we, one of the things that we do just is just really part of what enables us to do all of our jobs is we're careful students and we hope deep, thoughtful students of what's going on in our economy <clears throat> and in other economies. But one of the things that's been going on in our economy for close to a half century now is this rising inequality. <clears throat> and so the first thing that we do is <clears throat> we collect and publish a tremendous amount of data on this with the, um, the national accounts that we do with the Survey of Consumer Finance and many other areas. If you go to our website, there's an awful lot of data that we collect and put out about dis disparities in income and just income levels and by all, by all different kinds of, ca of categorizations. So we're a source of data, a, a big source of data on our website. Um, the second thing I'll say is the, the thing that we can really do, there are two things that we can really do with our policy. 
that matter. One of those, one of those is to enforce the fair housing laws. So we're, <clears throat> we have powers uh, that, to enforce fair housing laws. Not, every, uh, that, not all of those powers. They're shared around the bank regulators, but that's an important one. The second one really is, and maybe the single most important thing we can do, is if you look back at the very long expansion that ended with the pandemic, long expansion in ex mm -hmm. recorded U.S. history, 10 years and eight months, what started happening in the last three years was most of the gains were going to people at the lower end of the income right. spectrum. The gap between black unemployment and white unemployment was at historic lows. And there was no, the, by the way, the economy was not heating, overheating or anything like that. It was, we were looking at this and thinking, this is so good for, this is so good for the United States, so good for America. And it can go on, it can keep going and very beneficial. So the thing we can do is <clears throat> use our tools to get back to, it, it amounts to this, an extended period of strong labor market conditions. We know what that does. That, that you had companies, we heard the stories like this, companies were going into prisons and finding people who were not going to get out for a year or so and, you know, meeting them and, 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 talk, and starting to train people and get them, you know, <laughs> because they just, there just weren't enough workers. So very beneficial, positive things like that were happening. <clears throat> um, you asked about, we don't, the, the other thing I, is, we don't really have, it's, it's the elected branches of government that really have the, the, the tools that can address these questions of inequality, and that's, that's around education and all, all the things, tax policy, all those things are really not in our hands. <clears throat> but the tools that we have, we, we will use. I don't think of bank regulation as being, uh, you know, the, the point of bank regulation is to have banks be safe and sound. When banks aren't safe and sound and they collapse, they hurt. It, it, we saw this in the global financial crisis. You know, it's, it's really, really damaging to the broader economy. You had very high unemployment, and, and it, at that, that time, a very painfully slow recovery. <clears throat> because when the financial system is damaged the way it was, the economy was just going to grow. It grew very slowly for 10 years. It did grow for 10 years, which was great, but we never saw that 3, 4, 5 percent growth year that we, that we wanted to see. <clears throat> so, um, you mentioned earlier the employment mandate, and that obviously feeds <clears throat> into issues of income inequality and, and to a certain extent, wealth inequality. Um, and the Fed has recently gone from saying just maximum employment to also inclusive employment. Could you talk about <clears throat> that and what that means to you and how you think the Fed can play a role in inclusive employment? So, really, we're, it's, um, the goal is maximum employment, and <clears throat> the insight that we had, and part of it just was what we saw during that long expansion, is that to be maximum, it really needs to be inclusive, <clears throat> meaning um, uh, you need to be looking. Ultimately, we, like, as I mentioned, we don't have the tools to target particular groups or anything like that, but we do look at the data, you know, by racial and, and, and gender and, uh, and income and all, all of those things, immigrants, native-born, we look at, look at that data, and that, all of that informs our assessment of whether we're really at maximum employment. So <clears throat> we, we said that maximum employment is an, a broad and inclusive goal, and that's, that's part of our, our framework now. Great. And I think important, words matter, and I think having that word inclusive in there does <clears throat> make a difference. I'm going to start opening it up and to questions in about uh, two questions. So people can come to the mic, but we are giving preference to students. So we'd like students to stand up uh, first and then all the rest of you uh, <laughs> after. Uh, but I've got, I've got lots of questions that I could keep going on and answering. But let me ask you, um, this is part of a this visit is part of some of the learning tours that you do throughout the country. And, you know, you have thought that it was important for you to get out and actually talk to people about how they experience the economy. Could you give one or two things that maybe surprised you or that were important insights as a result of actually getting out and, and talking to people? Um. So it's, it works two ways. Of course, we have an obligation to go out and, exp and we want to explain what we're doing, and that's just part of our job. We want the public to understand what we're doing and why. That's part of it. The other part of it is, you know, um, we get incredible amounts of data, right, aggregate data, and you can only stare at it so long. 
I find, and I think all my colleagues find too, <clears throat> it, when you talk to people about their lives in the economy, it starts to form into a story and into a, a more, a more, uh, you know, a better understanding of the details of, of the lives that people are are, uh, are, le are leading. You know, so I mean, I I remember many trips I've taken, and inevitably you come back and and you say, well, I really learned something there. And I mean, I could, you know, we went to the Mississippi Delta a few years ago, and, and at uh, Mississippi Valley State, spent a great day there, visited a bunch of businesses and um, community deposit depository financial institutions. <clears throat> and um, what did I learn? I learned what life was like in the Delta, and you know, the way the way they they live and their aspirations. Met some really talented kids, by the way, which was great. Um, I learned that. We, I was in uh, another one. I was in New York, Pennsylvania, which is a, a small manufacturing town. And if you think about smaller manufacturing cities in the United States, the, the, you, what if you're the, my muscle memory would be that they must have really suffered because so much of our manufacturing base went overseas <clears throat> with China coming online and, and other countries as well. And the interesting about, thing about York was that I, what I learned was they actually had a strategy to combat that. And they, it, it kind of worked. I mean, they <clears throat> they had brought resources together around some manufacturing and some other business things, and, and it, it, it worked. York is, is a healthy, thriving city, and there are many other examples of cities that are just, just lost their manufacturing base, and they've just kind of collapsed fiscally. But I, I think it's, it was interesting to see that if you have a plan, it can actually work. Mm -hmm. And I'll go home, and I'll think about this trip, and I'll, I'll no doubt I'll learn some great things. Great. Well, we hope you will. <clears throat> um, one, one last question before I open up. Um, so what does fun look like for the chair of the <laughs> Federal Reserve Board? Like, you can't go to a cocktail party and say much. Uh, what, what, <laughs> how do you have fun? <laughs> for me, a big, big party, and I mean, this is, this is really as fun as it gets, is like a really good, a really good inflation report. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us today. My name is Catherine Stewart. I'm a graduating senior at Spelman College, majoring in economics, originally from the South Bronx area of New York City. So the Fed aims to have 2% inflation rate and to maximize employment and price stability. And as you mentioned earlier, the inflation rate is currently at 3%, so not necessarily where the Fed would like it to be. As we know from the principles of macroeconomics, over the long run in the business cycle, inflation decreases during recessions and increases during expansion. So my question for you is how will the Federal Reserve address the volatility of inflation while avoiding a potential recession in the economy? I know you mentioned earlier that one way would be raising interest rates, but can you think of another way that could address this dilemma? <laughs> great, great question. Thank you. So. Um, if you, if you look at, uh, at the history of campaigns to bring down high inflation, <clears throat> what you will see is in most instances, not all, but in most instances that has wound up, um, it, we know that, that higher interest rates, of course, will slow the economy and that's the way, that's the tool we have to bring down inflation. In many instances that has resulted in significant job loss necessary to restore price stability. We haven't seen that uh, here, and we've always felt, my colleagues have always, always felt that we, we had a chance, that there's a, there's a path to getting inflation back down to 2% without uh, that kind of large job loss. And I still believe that. I've always believed that. And, um, you know, we're on that path. But um, some softening in the economy is, is, has happened. You know, you, you've seen growth slowing back to a more sustainable level, and, you know, we hope we can stay on that path. We have to restore price stability because price stability is is really the bedrock of the economy, and you know uh, everyone. Once once prices are really stable, inflation is stable around two percent. <clears throat> people can stop thinking about inflation; they can focus on everything else. When when inflation is volatile and high, if you're me, not many are old enough to remember what that was like, but it, yeah. it's really really bad for businesses and households trying to plan. In terms of other tools, you know, I wish we had them, but the the, the tool. The fiscal authorities have their tools. We have our tools, and our tools are interest rates and our balance sheet, which is which affects interest rates as well. <clears throat> Next mic. Thank you for that. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Sounds good. Good morning, Dr. Gale and Chairman Powell. This has been such a didactic conversation, so thank you for all that you shared. We spoke a little bit about 
optimal employment and maximizing it and ensuring that it's inclusive. And so earlier when you were speaking, you spoke about your background, Chairman Powell, in private equity and investment banking, and even alluded to entrepreneurship. And so my question for you is, during these contractionary phases of the economy or where there's threats around contractionary phases of the economy, how can minority entrepreneurs ensure that their ventures are backed and armored to ensure that they're still stable during contractionary phases and when those policies are in use? Um, so how can minority entrepreneurs um, assure that their ventures are supported? And, and you know, so <clears throat> first of all, let me say uh, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation are kind of the secret or not so secret rocket fuel of the economy. It's entrepreneurs, both business and social entrepreneurs, who look at the world and see something missing and, and, and create it there. And, you know, I never, I, I'd never had that gift, uh, but the, the people who had that, those are the ones who really change the world. And, you know, you're, you're young and you're starting out your careers. If you, if you feel that way at all, you, you see something missing, my advice to you is to go for it uh, and, and don't hesitate. And uh, so entrepreneurs are, are huge. That, that's, what, that's how things happen in our economy is someone says, hey, we don't have an X. Let's, let's create this. So <clears throat> in terms of how to make it through hard times, I mean, it's uh, right right now, of course, um, if you go back before the pandemic, there was a whole lot of, of money for entrepreneurs in every field. It was, it was a time when, and, and that has dried up a bit, value, venture valuations have come down, but just know that it's a cycle. And um, many, 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 many ventures have, have gone from promising to almost dying to incredibly successful over time. And if you look back, I mean, you talk to any of the great entrepreneurs, they'll say, I had a time when I came this close to just wrapping it up and going to law school. Not, nothing wrong with going to law school. <laughs> but many, but they'll say, I stuck with it. Stuck with it, believe in your dream, and, and you know, keep pushing. Thank you so much. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Gale and Chairman Powell, I want to thank you for hosting this forum for the Atlanta University Center. Um, my question for you is, how do you anticipate the market. Oh, my name is Jonah Watts. I'm a sophomore business finance major, econ minor over at Morehouse College. Thank you. Um, my question for you is how do you anticipate the markets will respond to the acceleration of artificial intelligence uh, and economical resilience of Americans in the long run? Um, and what provisions has the Fed sought to account for this? So, artificial intelligence is something that everybody's, you know, spending a lot of time trying to understand. And, um, I, you know, we, we have experts in all the time and, and, and try to understand its, its implications for the economy. And, you know, there's just a range of views. We don't really know. It, the, the question will be whether it is, is employment augmenting, like so many technologies, so that it's not, <clears throat> or is it employment replacing? And over time, it may be first one and then the other. But that, that's the question. So if, if um, what new technology does is it raises productivity. In the short run, it can sometimes put people out of work, and that's true. Been true of, of advancing technology for forever. So, what is is AI going to be? And I think we have a very healthy discussion going on out there. We, we actually had a, a meeting at the Board of Governors in Washington with six or eight of the you know very well known. These were academic uh, economists and experts, and they were split. There were, there were people there who were on the optimistic end side of things, saying. You know, we, we basically have a labor shortage, and the economy wants to grow faster, and AI is going to help us do that, and, and it's going to lift all boats. And then there are other people who, who see that it can replace so many, <clears throat> so many tasks that are actually not, not just, uh, um, that, you know, that are pretty complicated tasks that, that, that you need some education to carry out, but AI can actually do them maybe even better than people. I don't think we know. I think... There's also another side to it, which is um, the potential uh, systemic ramifications of having AI and the financial markets interacting. And so there's a lot of thinking going on about this. We're in the early stages and a lot of uncertainty. So it's, I'd, I'd say it's going to be a while before we really understand how it needs to be regulated and what the, how do we capture the, the, the obvious potential productivity increasing benefits of it without uh, experiencing macroeconomic or financial stability uh, costs. Do you mind going over a little bit? Great. Um, 
So we'll take the next, the people who are standing now, because we're uh, at risk of going well over time, but uh, would love to get the quest next questions in. Thank you, Dr. Gale. Hello. Thank you both for being here. I'm Alicia Sawyer, a senior economics major from Atlanta, Georgia, also a Lisa D. Cook scholar. And my question is really about your background in investment banking and private equity. How has it impacted your decision-making process, both when you initially entered the public sector and where you are now? Um, so I've enjoyed all of the different parts of my career. I really feel like I learned a lot, and they all kind of inform <clears throat> everything. But so um, I, I was – when I was an investment banker, I w we were providing financial services to largely companies. So I learned to understand the capital markets and mm -hmm. also business models. You know, you, when you're working with a company, you, under, you need to understand why is this company here? What does it do that other companies can't do? How well does it compete and that kind of thing? So it was a real education in both <clears throat> how financial markets work and how they value things and also in, um, you know, in, in business strategy. You know, you, you need to understand the business strategy of a company to give them the service that they need. As a private equity investor, you're actually putting money to work right. <clears throat> behind these things. And I, you know, I, so I, I, what I, I'd say what I learned there was a lot more about business models and Warren Buffett likes to say when a, when a good manager meets a bad business model, usually it's the business model that wins. <clears throat> so you look for very strong defensible business models, and you also look for great management. I'll, I'll say, tell you something about, about management. When I, when I became a private equity investor, I asked the, you know, the head of our firm, who was a, a Hall of Fame investor, tell me about what, well, how do you spot a good manager? What does a good manager look like? How does that you know, what are the characteristics? And he said, there's so many different ways to, to do it. And, and so I've, what I've observed is, you know, there's, people can become good managers and good leaders who are very different from one another. So within each person, as long as you have a, a high level of self-belief and are willing to work really hard, there's a leader in there, there's a manager in there who can do it your way, you know, in your own particular way. I mean, there's some, there's some common factors, but... It really is remarkable how different, how, how many different paths there are to being successful in, in management and leadership. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Gale and Chairman Powell, for speaking with us today. My name is Peyton Thomas. I'm a senior psychology major from Hampton, Virginia. And I know that you spoke to a little bit what the Fed can and cannot do in terms <clears throat> of the racial wealth inequality in America. Um, do you have any advice for what we as young black college students can do to help combat that racial wealth inequality? You know, I, I, I will say this. The thing that has always moved me the, the most in that area is uh, education. So I was the founding chair of an inner city charity in Washington, D.C. I was also active in a similar charity in New York City to help ki inner city kids get an education. And you, you find their parents or often their single parent are desperate to get them the education they want and keep them away from trouble. And so there's so much to do there. And, you know, every kid who, who gets through 8th, ninth, 10th, 12th grade, you know, and, and is doing well at it, it's just a person who now has a chance at a middle-class life. And, and, a, and a, So I, I think that, to me, that's the, that's the thing. You know, our education, it's really, it's really hard and really important but um, education is the road for, for people. Uh, and, to, we, you know, we have um, one form of inequality is mobility. Mm -hmm. And th there's a lot of work by an economist named Raj Chetty, mm -hmm. who I know my colleagues know, mm -hmm. who, who really measures um, uh, mobility. And the U.S. actually has lower yes. income mobility than other major democracies, and it correlates heavily with race. So... Um, I think there's so much to do there. I mean, and I, I spent my wife and I spent I spent a lot of time and no small amount of money supporting this cause over 25 years. But I think that's a great cause. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Maya Spencer. I'm a sophomore economics major, management and organization minor from Williamsburg, Virginia. And my question is. What are the Federal Reserve's observations or analyses regarding the current trends in reduced consumer spending, and how does this impact economic indicators and the Fed's monetary policy consideration? Consumer spending, yeah. <clears throat> so consumer has been uh, very strong, and uh, it's been surprisingly strong. Uh, you know, there was um, 
what were called excess savings. So people couldn't spend money on trips and, you know, uh, restaurants and bars and, and things like that because it was COVID. Everybody was staying home. So they saved money. And also the government uh, um, gave, uh, you know, checks to people to sort of make them whole and replace their lost income and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so there were people had, particularly uh, people who were income constrained, had, had much larger piles of savings than, than they had before the pandemic. And there was always this thought that that would get spent down. And that so this very strong spending we had in 21 and 22 would ultimately go away. What's been amazing is how strong consumer spending has, has uh, continued to be. And uh, that may, it may well be, you do see though, you see credit card uh, borrowing going up. You see defaults going up now. So we may be actually getting to the end of that. We're, so to your point about monetary policy, we're of course, very, very carefully watching as the economy appears to be slowing this quarter. We think it's quite early in the, in the quarter to be able to say that, but we think the third quarter was very, very strong GDP. We think it's slowing now based on the limited data that we have, and all forecasters basically are saying that it will be. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're looking to see how much slowing there is. 70% of the U.S. economy roughly is, is you know, consumer spending, and so that's going to be the, the big thing, as, as long as unemployment remains low and employment remains high and wages are moving up above inflation, though, there's no reason why uh, spending wouldn't continue to, to hold in there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Princito. I am a sophomore international studies major from Dallas, Texas. And you touched on um, public service, and I really enjoy that because I believe that if you have an opportunity to give back, always do so. We are blessed to be at an institution um, that has a plethora of opportunities, but for those who do not have access to higher education and are just trying to make ends meet, what are the public service policies put in place that the Fed has, and how can we get involved? With the Fed? Mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, we hire, for example, if you look at the Atlanta Fed, we hire research assistants right out of college <clears throat> to work. There are some RAs, I think, at the Atlanta Fed. Raphael's nodding from Spelman. So we're we're very much uh, poised to take in young people, and um, I would I would just tell you to, uh, uh, you know, if you look on our website, reach out to us. We'll we'll be very happy to uh, interact with you. And um, you know, there are 12 reserve banks around the country, and they're mm -hmm. they're they're always hiring research assistants. There's also the board of governors in Washington. <clears throat> As you get down the road, if you if you were to do an e econ PhD or a law degree or just a general public policy, want to do public policy and you've got some experience, we you know we have in the whole system we have over thirty thousand employees. I want to say, mm -hmm. um, and and so, but that's the twelve reserve banks and the board together. We want people who want to do public service. It's uh, I'll just tell you, it's it's enormously satisfying to do public service. It's also satisfying to work in the private sector with a company and share that mission. You feel the same way about with, with that in the private sector, but nothing quite like serving the public. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, phenomenal questions. So I almost sat back down because they were so impressive. <laughs> so I could just give a hand to the, the strong <laughs> students. But um, Donnie Beamer from the Atlanta Mayor's Office, and I oversee our Office of Technology and Innovation. And so we want to make sure our entrepreneurs succeed. So see me about that afterward here in the city. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for organizing it. And it's a special treat for me because I'm a classically trained economist from Georgia Tech. I see my dean <laughs> in the front. Um, but I'm wondering, is there a target on labor force participation? Because unemployment is low, but it feels like those labor shortages you talked about are remaining. And it's been much larger in how it impacts our experiences and also people's household income. Uh, than what's reported. Great question. Let me let me open that up a little bit for people. So, um, you have, you have the general public, right? And a certain number of those people are either working or looking for work, actively looking for work, as, as in they've act, they've looked within the last month. And those people constitute the labor force. They are participating in the labor force either by being employed or by actively looking for jobs. But there are many many people who are not in the labor force. And you're, if you're not in the labor force, then, then you're not counted as unemployed. <clears throat> so so there, you've got to watch, you have to look at all of those things to understand how the labor market's going. 
the during the pandemic, many people dropped out of the labor force. And so we thinking, we were thinking, I thought, I'll just say, I thought that when, when, the, when the vaccines came out and the economy reopened, that people would come right back, but they didn't. Uh, you ask, is there a number that we target? The answer is not really. We, we have an assessment of, if, if you look at what drives, um, I mean, the thing, that, the thing that is happening with labor force participation is as the population ages, as people get into their older years, they become less likely to be in the labor force. And so there's a downward trend in labor force of about a quarter of a percent a year. Um, but that doesn't mean in any given year that, that labor, force can't go, labor force participation can't go up. There's nothing like a really hot labor market like the one we've had to bring people back in, and it did in, um, in, uh, in 2023. Or people stopped dropping out. It's the same thing. The net was, uh, was that labor force participation increased. Immigration also uh, increased, which is, that's a whole other thing. That's just an increase in the population. And immigrants who come in, they tend to go into the labor force in about the same proportion, roughly, as, as uh, people who are already here. So we wouldn't have a particular number. Um, we're, we're not quite back to the level of labor force participation that we were at before the pandemic. But that was, a, the, at, before the pandemic, we had had a, you know, a 10 year, eight month expansion. And participation tends to creep up as a lagging indicator in a strong labor market. So we're at a pretty high level of participation, as high or higher than the models would have, would have predicted. But, you know, we'd love to see it go up further. You know, we, we actually have lower labor force participation rates than many other advanced economies, which is, you know, not our self-image as a country and not where we want to be. There's, there's just a lot to do in the labor field. So another thing, if you're looking for an area of economics to study or a field to work in, the whole area of, of, uh, of labor market economics and, and, you know, what, how do we, how do we, uh, support a better workforce, invest in a, in a great workforce is a, is a very important area to think about, uh, about studying and working in. Well, this is wonderful. Uh, are you getting ready to close out? Um, all right. Well, I will let you close out. Um, Dr. Holmes, thank you for all you've done to help to uh, pull this program together. I also want to thank Lauren for her wonderful introduction. Um, and I'll let you close out, and I might have one word after you. Oh, sure. sure. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Well, no, I want to thank you, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for making this an enlightening and engaging event. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Powell, for coming to Spelman. Thank you to your team for making this a successful event. And thank you for everyone in the audience also for participating, and for your thought-provoking questions, for those who did have questions. Um, I want to thank the Spelman community who also helped to make this a success. So the president's team, uh, communications, STS, public safety, and many more, and President Gill. I will let you, you, you wrapped it up lovely. I would just say, uh, again, thanks to everybody. This has been a fabulous morning. Um, it has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to you, Chairman Powell, for spending the time giving of yourself, but most importantly, for what you do for our nation and for the world. It, public service uh, takes a lot out of the person, their family. Um, so we really owe you a debt of gratitude. But I think people recognize after this conversation why you are the right person in that role for these times. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.